I feel like lots of people get stopped by lots of things. I remember uh, stopping very quickly when I heard someone in the office say, snake. <laughs> uh, turns out that the snake was down the back paddock, but got my attention, right? Uh, I was doing some cleaning out the back of the Sugar World uh, office area that was the home, uh, the church at Mulgrave when I was pastoring there for a number of years. And uh, I was just sweeping the footpath and I had this feeling that something was behind me, right? Uh, I think we've all experienced that. Anyway, uh, it backs on to Sugar World, the, the nature reserve and, and water park at, up there in Edmonton. As I turned around, here's a peacock in full feathered bloom about a metre behind me, just kind of strutting at stuff. <laughs> oh my goodness, my, uh, I won't say my heart stopped because I'm still here, but certainly startled me. People are stopped in their tracks by all kinds of things. Sadly, I've known people who were stopped in their tracks relationally. Maybe they got burned in a relationship or even in a marriage. And they thought the relationship was invincible, but sadly it comes to an end. And either consciously or subconsciously, they decided to never allow anyone to get that close again. Stuff happens in our world, in our lives. I want to tell you this uh, true story. Uh, it'll give you some insight into my early life. My grandmother was the first station mistress, or that's what they called the person in charge of a local railway station back in the day. So we're talking about the 50s and 60s. Uh, she'd done it around uh, Pick and Bar, um, not Pick and Bar, um, Pie Alba and Woodgate and a whole bunch of areas up and down the Fraser Coast. And then because of medical reasons with my grandfather, moved to Launton and became the station mistress at Launton. My grandfather had a heart attack at 45 and he was told he couldn't work, but effectively he became the station master, right? Uh, but my grandmother had the title. So she would be in the office and he'd be doing all the other stuff. So I lived with them for a number of years uh, before my mum and dad were waiting on a housing commission house. So the whole, my family lived with my grandparents. Uh, that, that was pretty common back in the day. And so I was in the station house and we had all the mod cons, like a phone you know, out on the, the veranda that I was never allowed to go and see. But the best one, the best one was that my grandfather had the responsibility that when a train was coming, he'd have to go and close the gates. So the gates are wooden gates on a wheel and, you know, obviously you close the gate and you go the other side and you come back and you close the gate. He, he would do it manually. So I'd be the strong one as, as a four-year-old or a five-year-old or a six-year-old holding the gate. He's doing all the work, but of course I was doing the pushing, right? And that, it was an amazing experience of um, watching the train then, stepping aside and watching the train. And my grandfather taught me how to grab a two-cent piece and put it on the line. And then the train goes through and it becomes a 50-cent piece, you know, in, within a couple of seconds and going looking along the line for where this coin had been absolutely annihilated and flattened, but we'd go picking out these coins. Here's the problem. My grandfather was both the best person in the world for keeping people safe, but the worst person in the world when the train was late <laughs> because he'd have the time schedule, go and close the gates, Anybody who wanted to pass through and escape Launton, essentially, and go out onto Gippy Road and do whatever business they wanted to do, was stopped by those gates. And you couldn't get through. Some silly people would do a runner. You ever done that on boom gates? Come on. No honest people here? <laughs> no, you don't, do you? And you didn't back then either. So people would be held up, they'd be stopped, literally stopped on their tracks for 
at a very significant period of time. I've known people who've been stopped in their tracks spiritually. Something happened to cause them to either give up on the church, give up on their faith or give up on God. Some people have felt like calling it quits in some other area of life. And so many people live with some disillusionment or disappointment. And if you ever felt like quitting or are facing obstacles that are just sometimes and some days facing obstacles can feel like they're too big, I've got really good news for you. There's examples in the book of Acts that show the resilience of God's church. And that's where we're heading today. We're digging into what it means to be resilient in faith. And in particular, resilient in following Jesus. So today our focus is, I believe we need to be resilient as a church on a journey of following Jesus. Uh, it's true that a resilient church is full of resilient individuals. So we have to be resilient in our faith first, but we, when, when we're gathered together, we are a powerful force in the name of Jesus Christ. This body of Christ needs to dig into a strong faith, support one another, and continue to be a church that loves disciples and multiplies and it takes effort it takes attitude and it takes effort there is an, a resilient faith that is available to every single one of us that was the focus last week no matter what obstacles or outward circumstances seem to stand in our way God's greater than whatever it is that brings distraction or obstruction remember resilience is bouncing back to a Christ likeness. And a returning to the person that God has really designed and crafted us to be. I don't believe God makes any mistakes. So if you look internally and you say, I don't like what I'm seeing, uh, God has not made a mistake with you. And we just need to turn to the scriptures Turn to the Lord in prayer, turn to a resilient faith and trust him. That's where we were last week because he's ready to enable you to stand strong, not lose heart and not give up. Resilient is the word that comes to mind when I think about the early church. The challenges that they experienced, which was conflict, controversy, threats, all kinds of things, those challenges fueled the fire that spread across the first century church and brought the gospel to the whole world. These new Jesus followers were inspired and energized by a lifestyle of hope, freedom and forgiveness, something that they had not experienced prior to becoming Christians. They, when they were introduced to the way, they found a way to actually live life to the fullest. Now, the opposition was pretty thick and fast. The religious leaders of the day were the perpetrators of most of the opposition. We kind of think of the early church being persecuted by Rome, and that's true, but the strongest persecution came from within the uh, Jewish system. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the synagogue officials all tried to shut down the message of Christ. But Peter and John, in the context of chapters 4, 5 and 6, and if you've got your Bible, go to Acts 4. We're heading there right soon. Peter and John proclaimed the word of God boldly. And in Acts 4 and verse 18, then they called them, the, the officials called them in again, and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. So the context is, in chapter 3, Peter and John had performed miracles in Jesus' name. Uh, but this activity upset the religious officials of the day. It wasn't their go-to thing, not what they wanted to see happen. 
It wasn't part of the religious order. It's all happening, this particular activity is all happening around the Temple Mount, where the, the temple effectively is in Jerusalem. Religious leaders are trying to wrestle back from Jesus' followers. They're trying to wrestle back power. There's a power struggle right at the beginning of the church in Acts. Does that resemble anything at all? There's constantly a power struggle. Officials of all different kinds are trying to wrestle power back in our society. It's interesting that the church can be placed into a difficult situation. Uh, at one of my previous churches, there was a significant building project proposed for the next door block. Uh, we were on two acres and there was an acre next door. Somebody bought the acre next door and they were building storage sheds and childcare. Uh, the builder required access to our property, owner builder, in order to get a preferred entry position. And it meant that our common driveway would be uh, removed of 50% of our car parking. So we had to go into negotiation. Long story short, we negotiated and signed a legal contract to ensure the church had its access free from any encumbrances and a 24 seven thoroughfare and a retention of some of the uh, neighbours one acre to offset the five car parks that we let go. So God was good, but it was a battle to get there. We're sometimes called upon to lean outside our core business of love. When things happen and require our attention, because it is true, I'm going to make this statement, that uh, some people think the church is a soft touch, right? And uh, we are soft in the middle, appropriately. Uh, but we're also very resilient to protect what God has given to us. Amen? Um, and, and we need to have that attitude that what is God's is God's, be it language, be it possession, be it heart. When God owns a heart, he is not going to let it go. So when God restores a person and gives them new life in Christ, he's not going to let it go. But we need to participate with him. True? In order to be resilient, we need to participate. He has designed resilience in order to keep us strong, safe and effective. But when we don't participate in relationship or when we don't participate in faith, um, we don't, we've got no right to blame God, yeah? Some may think it's pretty much um, a matter of counting money and banking it if you're in administration here at Northreach. Um, some may think that extends to paying electricity bills. But on any day, you could be thrown up a sewer pipe burst uh, or a tree that's been blown over or somebody's lost a fence or a car park has subsided and you need to mix up some concrete and fill it up. All of these things basically require immediate attention and we have an administration staff for that purpose. You never know when you get out of bed and come to this place, what might happen before morning tea? <laughs> There's, it's just alive with people and things that happen. That's one reason why we have a management team as well as an eldership. Management team handle things on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis. Elders look after our spiritual need. Diving back into Acts chapter 4, Peter and John had been told on several occasions not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus Christ. Those religious leaders had warned them. So when Peter and John wouldn't keep quiet, the leaders locked them up. We find that in chapter 4 verse 3. 
Effectively, they're in prison. They're in a jail. And then God sent a messenger to restart what the religious leaders had stopped. And I love this story. We'll just kind of touch on it. Because we talked about Satan obstructing last week. And sometimes it seems like the devil has won. Things get really hard or the feeling for us is that it's impossible. You know, we, we're just at our end. And maybe that's the opportunity, though, to increase resilient prayer. Maybe when things get really tough, that's the opportunity for us to go deep into the Word of God and into prayer. I love this story. So we jump into chapter 5, Acts 5, 19 and 20. Uh, During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, go back to where you were, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. It's a miracle that they're free. And the angel told the apostles to go back to the temple, pick up where they left off. There's, There's a question, there's a statement, there's an opportunity for Peter and John. They're in jail, then they're not in jail. And the angel says, the message is, go back, preach Jesus. Okay, so who's going to do that? Uh, The one answer that's very clear is, Peter and John are going to do that, right? Would I do that? I'm hoping that I would. But the opportunity was theirs and they took it. What I love about Peter and John is they don't give in, they don't give up, and somehow they refuse to get sidetracked or discouraged. They just keep on track and moving forward in their ministry. It was time for them to get back to work, effectively. And that was their decision. But here's the thing. What we find is that the resilience of the church, the early church, was their power source. Now, there's people right across the auditorium and some at home online that don't yet have power. I'm telling you, I'm so thankful when that power came back on at our place. It's been so hot. (laughs) Hard, difficult. And the faithful praying and following church was the power source in the New Testament. We see it time and time and time again. But a faithful following church, a resilient church, is a power source in our community. We don't often think about that, right? Because I know that some people feel like the church just gets battered. You know what? We are powerful in the name of Jesus Christ. So powerful, sometimes we're even, uh, and I'm looking for a better word, but we're even a bit scary for a lot of people because God is so powerful, all powerful, and we are his direct descendants. Isn't that cool? So much of the apostles' ministry is upheld by the faithful Christians. Peter and John, go back and preach, but there's an army praying for you. There's an army upholding you. They are prayerfully upheld. And if we go to Acts 5 and 21, at daybreak, and that just illuminates to me that there's people waiting at the temple at daybreak, right? Waiting to hear. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they'd been told and began to teach the people. And when the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin and the full assembly of the elders and uh, sent to the jail for the apostles. Too late. (laughs) The power of prayer. Because Peter and John went right back to doing what God had called them to do. And I'll say again here, as I believe it's appropriate, the Bible says what God had called them to do. 
essentially, that's, that's our responsibility. So we don't have to do Peter and John. We do you. And capture that, the importance of that. That we don't have to reflect or be somebody else. Whatever our call is, whatever we feel so tightly connected to in Christ is our only responsibility. Because he's, all, he's called us all to love, hasn't he? He's called us all to generosity. He's called us all to care. That, that's in our DNA as people of God. But the specific ministry call, only we know the voice of God in our life. And it's the thing that we have the passion for. It's the thing that kind of gets us up in the morning. That's, that's going to be our call, right? Not the thing we want to invent because we've seen someone else do it and it looks cool and that looks, you know, people will identify with that. That's not it. It's the thing that triggers you, gets your energy. They ultimately saw the power of God in action through prayer. And as a result, in Acts chapter 6, the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests. Did you see that? A large number of the law providers became obedient to the faith. You know the church displays its resilience when even the priests become obedient to the faith. All right, tongue in cheek. But in this context, that is awesome. In the early church and the development of Christianity, that right there is life changing. And the very fact that these things happened shows the power of love for one another shown by the early church. Because God's hands can't be tied, his message can't be silenced and his purpose will be fulfilled in his time. And all that power comes from God. The Spirit of God makes his church, his people and his purpose resilient. I have a faithful choice to be resilient and keep Jesus as my Lord. Honestly, he won't let me down, but maybe I will let him down. And I make that choice. And when we together make that choice, exponentially, the power of God is amazing, isn't it? In and through his people. Or what I should have said is, we see the power of God and say it's amazing. Because his power is amazing whether we're connected to it or not. You just can't stop what God is doing. And God will do what God wants to do. Last week we talked specifically about the Apostle Paul, that he possessed resilient determination, that he had resilient integrity. And we see Paul has this attractive humility and that enabled him to live a life with a resilient faith. So if we're gonna make it personal, what about you and me? How? How can we be resilient? And for the rest of my time, I just want to look at three things and say that Christians are filled with God's Holy Spirit. His Spirit is our power source. It's not even that we uh, claim to know God and automatically have his wonderful power. They won't do it. But when we are in Christ, and I tried to explain that last week, that through repentance and faith, when we believe in Jesus and accept that we're sinners in need of a saviour and we come to him, repent of sin, confess and ask him to forgive us, he is faithful and righteous to forgive. Amen? And then we are in Christ. So that's the power source because in Christ 
inherits the Holy Spirit. And we become spirit-filled people with spirit-filled power. And that's the foundational and most primary quality for all people in any time and space. When we're in Christ, we are Christian. Not just by name, but by being, and we have that inheritance with Christ. But we know when many who are spirit-filled are gathered together, there is that increase of power in the spirit. And that's the lesson of the early church, coming together, praying, and we see the power source. In response to the criticism from the religious leaders, they say, you do not know that the power performing these miracles is from Jesus. The very one you crucified and God raised him from the dead is the same Jesus Christ and his spirit is powerful. They give that every person who would place their trust in him, believe in him, would be saved. And they were also clear about how to accept Jesus' salvation through repentance. And they were so bold in what they proclaimed. It's pretty obvious that they'd seen something that inspired them on the deepest level. They couldn't keep their mouths shut. And you've still got the chief of the temple police and some Sadducees arresting them and throwing them in jail. So kind of rest, trying to wrestle back that power. But already about 5,000 people had, had believed in the message that was being proclaimed. Uh, the next day, a meeting was called to discuss what to do with these two, Peter and John. The rulers, the religious leaders, religion scholars, along with chief priest, everybody who was anybody was there. And they stood Peter and John in the middle and they grilled them. They asked, who put you in charge? What business do you have doing this? And then Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, lets go in verse 8 of chapter 4. You're going to love this. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man, talking about the miracle, who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then you better know this, you and all the people, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. And Jesus is the stone that you builders rejected, which was become the cornerstone. In verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus and since they could see the man who'd been healed standing there with them there was nothing they could say verse 15 so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together what are we going to do with these men they asked everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they've performed a notable sign and we can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we've got to warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. And they were just standing there so confident and so sure of themselves. See if this sounds like Peter and John are resilient. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you guys or to him? You be the judge. And in verse 20, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. A cloud of witnesses, right? What they've seen and heard. And after further threats, they let him go. 
because they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. There's an effect upon the church. The churches are resilient. Individuals within the church, the apostles are resilient and resilience wins the day. But only in Jesus' name. Not strength of people, but the power of God in their life. I love it. Peter and John were so strong, weren't they? A model for us now. I found myself sometimes opposed by our religious leaders. In areas of doctrine or interpretation of scripture, we've got some Bible scholars here and uh, everyone's aware, particularly in the last five years, but the last forever, I want us to interpret the scripture a bit differently. Let's be culturally relevant. Say what we think is culturally, you know, kind of popular. I think immediately we would do that, we've usurped the authority of the scriptures. My position, read it, absorb it with prayerful thought, understand it and live it out. Simple formula. Um, that's just me, right? Because I'm not smart enough to actually interpret it my own way and stay consistent with that. So I'm just a dummy who reads it and believes it. Here we see religious leaders of the day trying to harness the gospel using their considerable leverage. Now I don't want to miss this bit seeing how it all started. We've got to see Acts chapter 4, verse 8. This is the pinnacle thing for today. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, you have just the rulers and the elders of the people. God is God. The reason he could do what he did, say what he said, is because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And we can't be this kind or any kind of resilient on our own. You can't be a resilient Christian in your own strength. And I say praise God for that. Because when we're connected to Jesus and it's his resilience, we're so protected and enabled to not go beyond ourselves or push ourselves forward. But God won't have any of that. It's for his glory, isn't it? So I, I feel like the power source being of God is a wonderful enabler, but it it's also uh, keeps us in the channel, keeps us on the track. Peter replied, repent and be baptised in Acts 2.38. Here's how the people were being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he tells a crowd of thousands, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptised because the Bible says clearly that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, power, protection, clarity, comfort, conviction, comprehension, understanding and insight, I'm in. Spirit-filled, resilient followers of Jesus are courageous. They saw Peter's courage in verse 13. They heard his repeated claims that Jesus is the only way to salvation. And in Acts 4, verse 12, no one else. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. He's just repeating what Jesus himself said. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Don't you love John 14, 6? What a comfort. And here's the third one. Resilient Christians are connected to Jesus. 
In Acts 4.13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And here's what they took note of, that these men had been with Jesus. Isn't it beautiful to know that people can see us in the street and by the power of the Holy Spirit can know that we are connected to Jesus just by our actions, by our speech, by our love, by our care, by our sustaining, by our faith. And here's how. I've lost power. Can someone take me to the final slide, please? Yeah. To spend time in his word, because this is the one way he communicates with us, or one of the ways. Spend time in prayer and get into a life group or a study group. Life group leaders, there's a, a meeting in about 15 minutes uh, in Andrew's office. And uh, Jacob and Sarah, uh, Jacob, can you, where are you? He's over here. Jacob and Sarah's here. Uh, they lead our life group's ministry. If you need to connect into a group, please go see them. It's actually really good to hang around God's people, spend time in his word together and listen to what he's got to say corporately as well as sharing what God is saying to us personally. Can I ask you to stand as we pray? The team comes. What a privilege it is to know the Saviour. How good is it to have a life source that just never gives up on us? How good is it to know the truth? Father, we stand before you as a people that desire to reflect your love and your life. Lord, as we uh, go about being in our communities, as we go about living our life, our desire is that people will see Jesus in us. People will see that we, we are strong and uh, they, they, we don't want them to see that we avoid uh, the afflictions of this world, but we're strong and in Christ and he protects us. So there's nothing that's going to happen that he won't give us the strength for. We love you, Lord.